All right. This is Q on CBC Radio 1, Sirius 137, coming to you live from the Glen Gould studio. Well, they fight, they call each other names, they perform for the cameras, and we vote for them. It does sound like I'm referring to a crop of reality TV contestants, but I'm actually talking about the leaders of our fine nation. Yes, the world of politics has a culture all its own, and it affects us all. Now, to the south of us in the United States, there's talk of coming together, a new culture of consensus and a new way of doing politics. But what about here at home? My next guest is the founder of not one but two federal political parties. Preston Manning changed Canadian politics forever when he started the Reform Party in 1987, not 1897. Sorry, Preston. I, I, I almost, which he helmed for 13 years. Then he went on to reform the Reform Party and created the Canadian Alliance in 2000. He officially retired as a politician in 2002, but his life post politics is, well, as political as ever. He's a frequent media commentator, regular public speaker, and the president president and CEO of the conservative think tank called the Manning Center for Building Democracy. He's also a companion of the Order of Canada. Preston Manning is in Toronto to share some big ideas at Idea City, a gathering of 50 artists, authors, and thinkers from all walks of life. We've whisked him here to the Glen Gould studio to find out where he comes down on party politics versus the politic of consensus and what he thinks Canadians should demand to see in our political culture. Welcome, Preston Manning. Yeah! Very good to have you here. Now, I know you're not directly performing at the North by Northeast Music Festival, <laughs> no, no. but you do have you have a, a nephew or somebody who's involved in, in, in the music business, is that true? Well, my boys, uh, we have, Sandra and I have five children. They're, they're in their uh, late 20s, 30s, and 40s now, but uh, my two boys were in a band called the Buicks, along with two cousins, and uh, uh, that was my exposure to the music world. Were you a fan of the Buicks? Oh, yes, I was a fan. <laughs> also a financier. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, listen, I want to get to the big ideas on uh, Canada's political culture, and, and, and uh, your... But, and this idea of whether we can achieve a political consensus. But let me first get your take on what happened in Canadian politics this week. Because uh, if I can put it basically or crudely, we have the Prime Minister and we have the Leader of the Opposition yelling, yelling at each other in the House of Commons, uh, seemingly uh, uh, completely divided, partisan as ever. Uh, the leader of the opposition saying they're going to bring down the government. Then they seem to go to coffee together for uh, <laughs> a, a, have a couple have a lunch, have a couple of meetings, and end up uh, seeming to to get along and deciding that there won't be an election. Was this the politics of consensus, or is this back more backroom uh, deal making? No, I, I think one of the weaknesses of our current system is just the intense uh, partisanship, and it, it it's gets going during the election, and in our case, because there's a minority parliament, this is one big difference between the United States. The, the Obama administration is a clear majority here with this minority parliament. The uh, uh, partisanship uh, just uh, uh, takes over, and, uh, and I, I think it's one of the, it's, it's destroying people's faith in the system, in the parliament, showing up in the declining support in elections, participation in elections. So what, what do you think they really talked about, Stephen Harper and Michael Ignatieff? Well, I, I mean, were I, they kind of, was that, a, was, were they well, really negotiating well, or were they... One thing you've got to be careful about is uh, judging, uh, one of the most unfortunate things about the Canadian political system is the most frequent image of our parliament on television is that fool question period which is its worst feature. It, it's like a soap opera. You don't like question period. No, I never like, I'm not a good actor. Like I can't feign rage when I don't feel it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was never very good at it. And I was criticized for being like, I want to just ask straight questions and get straight answers. Because then I would get hammered. I get hammered by the media because I wasn't providing the sparks that mm. Lucien Bouchard and Chrétien would uh, produce. But uh, it, it's one of the poorest features of our, our, our parliament, whereas in the United States, the most frequent uh, image of the United States Congress is, is the congressional hearing, which, which you know, the, the senators or, or congressmen are sitting mm -hmm. there like judges, kind of raised. There's an expert witness there that's very uh, erudite. And uh, we show the worst feature of ours on television. They show one of the best features. In well, I, now, I know you've been talking about uh, consensus or, or that you don't like the level of, of partisanship and that, that there's a better way forward. But is this really uh, different from uh, any, any other era? I mean, haven't people always lamented the level of partisanship? And has, 
hasn't that been the game in politics yeah, yeah. in question period? But there used to all be all through the there, generations. There, there used to be some areas where there would be bipartisan or multipartisan cooperation. It used to be the area of foreign affairs. But wh when the Bloc Quebecois became the official opposition, the, the government understandably did not want to share even foreign affairs uh, briefings and that with the opposition, and that broke down. So in in Canada, there doesn't seem to be any area that where this partisanship does not intrude. Uh, one area that I've tried to work on is uh, a, a lot of these modern issues, uh, environmental issues, health issues, uh, human swine flu, uh, uh, greenhouse gases, are, are science-based issues. And uh, some of us have been trying to see us, can we not get cooperation among the parties on science, technology, and innovation? This is a, not a partisan thing. Uh, in, in the British Parliament, they have a thing called the... Uh, the uh, Parliamentary Office for Science and Technology. It's supported by all parties to provide uh, accurate scientific information to whoever, no matter what side of the debate you're on. If you could find some area where there could be some uh, cross-partisan cooperation, you might start a process mm. that would grow into other areas. Uh, we talk about what's happening in the United States, and I feel like it's the first time in my lifetime Partly sometimes because we have stereotypes about Americans, and, but it's the first time that we're actually regularly, seemingly in the media and, 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 and in our streets and in our, in our homes, talking about what's happening in the U.S. and whether we could adopt that in, in, in Canada. But uh, Obama, President Obama, has talked about a new way of doing politics, less partisan and polarized, and he talked about bringing people together, left, right, east, west, various faiths. Is coming together in politics really possible, or is this just appealing rhetoric? Oh, no, I, th I think it is uh, possible. In, in the United States Congress, for example, you cannot get a bill on the order paper unless you're able to do some coalition building. You know, I'll support your fish bill if you'll support my cotton bill. Uh, th that system does not work uh, here. In, in Europe, where they've changed the voting system so that hardly anybody ever gets a, a clear majority, you have to learn coalition building in order to even form government. Uh, in Canada here, uh, uh, this skill of coalition building is not well developed, and, it, and it's not encouraged in our, our parliament. Even, you know, the seating arrangements in our parliament, the desks are two swords lengths apart. That was so, in the old days, if you got your sword out, you couldn't quite hack the other guy. The, right. the, 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 the symbol, the mace, the mace, which is the big symbol of authority in our power, the mace was a club for hitting people over the head. Like it's, even the symbolism is not conducive right. to coalition bills. So people are clapping for hitting people on the head. <laughs> I'm not that's sure. That's the wrong idea. Yeah, right? that's not what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but if you've been talking about bringing people together and building consensus, and I get that you believe it, I've been reading the, the, the pieces you write for the Globe and Mail, etc. Some could make the argument that creating the Reform Party was actually a divisive move, at the height of partisanship. Uh, you, you know, not just dividing uh, uh, between uh, the West and East, but even within the conservative movement, as you've called it. You know, setting up a party that is different from the conservative party, the progressive conservatives, etc. Do you wish you had done anything differently in the name of consensus then? How do you reflect on that time now? Well, it, again, it depends which end of the pipe you're, you're looking through. We, we argued the Conservative Party would collapse in the West, and if somebody hadn't created something like reform, what you would have had is a full-blown Western separatist movement at the same time you had one in Quebec, and, and you would have blown the country apart. So we felt we were actually contributing to keeping Confederation together. But even the creation of a new party, like, like Reform, itself was a coalition building exercise. We had fiscal conservatives and some social conservatives, democratic conservatives, constitutional conservatives. A and today, I, I think building, building new parties or even running an old party is an exercise in coalition building, and it's a skill that's not well developed in our system. So you don't believe that politics, and particularly parliamentary politics, are inherently combative? Well, there's, there's, there's natural disagreements, and there should be. If you're offering alternatives, th there should be you know, room to argue the alternatives. But uh, my, my father spent his entire life in provincial politics, uh, he 25 years as premier in Alberta, and he used to give a little talk to his troops, uh, cabinet ministers, members of the legislature, about every two years, and it was that the public are never as partisan as the partisans. They will never love you and your program and your party the way you may love them, and they will never dislike or hate your opponents the way you do. There's a line. They, mm -hmm. they expect you to be different and they expect you to argue. But you cross
cross that line by presenting yourself as the greatest answer to everything or, or demonizing your opponents. You cross the line where you start losing the so public. So why can't people learn that lesson? Why well, can't politicians learn that lesson? Well, they've got to be taught that. They, but, <laughs> well, can you teach them that? I mean, well, they, you, you know, because people, obviously, especially younger people, uh, are, are disengaged. And to a certain extent, it's yeah. because you, you turn on the television and you watch these people, as you say, acting or, uh, yeah. you know, being outraged, and, and, and it doesn't, but, it doesn't but, feel but, authentic uh, at times. Yeah, like a lot of us Canadians, when we don't like something, what we do is we distance ourselves from it. We pull out of it. That's exactly it. We say, well, I don't want anything to do with that. The, the other approach is to get involved. Like if 400 people showed up in the House of Commons in the galleries and booed during the question period, uh, that would get on the evening news, and it would probably send the right message. But <laughs> All right. I believe, I believe that was a call to arms, <laughs> Q audience. Just don't tell them I sent you. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, nobody will find out you said that, yeah, Preston. Right, 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 right. <laughs> we are on the air. You know? uh, I, I have to ask you before, before I let you go. You wrote a column about how Canadian politicians could learn a lot, in your view, from Cirque du Soleil. Uh, <laughs> what, do you, what, you remember writing this, yeah, right? Yeah. What, what, what do you think the politicians can learn from circus superstars? Well, Cirque du Soleil reinvented the circus, and the circus was kind of in the same state as the parliament and the parliament is, is today. The a lot of clowns. A lot of clowns. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, animals. <laughs> uh, no, the, the circus business was in decline, and people were staying away from it. They weren't entertained by it. They didn't like it. And what Cirque du Soleil did was really reinvent an old, uh, very, very old tradition. You know, the cir circus has been around forever. And my point was that I think we have to reinvent our politics in such a way that it is attractive to people, and particularly attractive to a younger generation. So it wasn't... <laughs> there wasn't any, anything specific in what Cirque du Soleil has done that you were using as a, you're just saying in terms of reinvention. Well, no, there's a whole, there's a whole book uh, called The Blue Ocean Strategy that analyzes the, the, what Cirque du Soleil uh, did. And, and one of the things they did was they attracted to their new uh, form of a circus uh, near customers that had never been really going to circuses. Right. They, they attracted people that had been to ballet, that had been to uh, uh, to uh, gymnastics things. Big tents, yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so, you know, one of the things politics, party politics has to do is start attracting the near customers, the people people are involved in interest groups, mm. in, uh, in advocacy mm. groups. They're just not translating that right. into that, involved in the democratic Isn't process. that what the Liberal Party tries to do? Well, that's what everybody tries to do, but right. nobody's very successful at it. And, uh, uh, so I think a lot could be learned from Cirque du Soleil. Very quickly, I, I, I had to ask you about this. I know you're a proud grandfather, yeah. uh, so I'm cu curious to get your views on this. A study came out, this is two weeks ago in Britain, I don't know if you heard about this, that tracked political leanings based on the gender of your kids. And the more girls that you have, the further to the left you will be. And <laughs> Well, our family, we have three girls and two boys. Yeah, it didn't seem to work for you. <laughs> so you don't buy that. I, I how, have you, how have your kids affected your, your politics? Well, what, one of the main impacts, not, not just our kids, but our, our grandkids, is on environmental issues. Uh, they, they are passionate about that. My <coughs> oldest son is uh, very, very much involved. Well, we have some ranch land in southeastern Alberta, and he's uh, committed to preserving some of that old prairie wool. And, uh, and our grandkids, I, I was uh, one of them, that's not, one of our daughters has four boys all under, uh, under 12, and we were looking after them, and I was trying to round them up and get them to brush their teeth, and I turned the water on. I was chasing them around to get them to brush their teeth, and the one little guy says, you're wasting water, he says. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah, and then he says, you're going to run out of water. <laughs> and so, you know, th that, that's been one of the big impacts on me. Very good to have you here, sir. Thank you. Preston Manning, did you meet Jizza? Did you get to meet Jizza? Uh, you did, yeah. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. I'm Gian Gamashi. Q Live continues in just a moment from Toronto.